Okay, guys. Uh, let's get this show on the road. So, welcome to our first ever uh, Rise and Rams Robotics uh, live stream. Uh, today, we're going to be running through how to design a robotic goalie. And Gabe, as of right now, I'm your team captain. In the future, I won't be your team captain, uh, as I've already graduated. Um, but for the time being, I will remain your captain. And for today, I will be your instructor for these next three sessions. So today, next, uh, this coming Friday, and then next Monday. Um, we're going to split this design tutorial into three parts so that it doesn't run too long. We don't want to be here taking up your time all day. Uh, we're going to try and keep them to about 45 minutes to an hour each part. And then, yeah, we're going to split it into three parts. So our first part is going to be physics and general concepts, talking about things like how big, how heavy, how fast, what parts, um, basically like the hows and whys. In the next part, we're going to be talking about concept sketching. So uh, where do you put things? Uh, how big are the parts? Uh, where are we going to put bolt holes? Where are we going to put bearings? What do I think about when I'm placing these things? That way you guys can get some insight onto, like, the way I think when I design my way through things. And then in the final part, we're going to do like the detailed design. So we're going to do like the CAD, like the final CAD. Uh, yeah, like getting all the actual parts and uh, all the design parts into the design, into a full assembly, uh, everything. Now, actually, give me one really quick second. My slide is cut off, and I'm not loving it. Okay. Uh, tch, tch, tch. Yeah, that's better. And then I need to go. Nope. Oh, I see. Now, if I go. Just bear with me here for a second, guys. My slide's getting cropped off. Now, I don't think it's going to be an issue, but this hasn't happened before. Oh, I see the problem. Uh oh. Get rid of you. Yep. Insane. That's much better. Now you can see the whole slide. Uh, okay. Oh, my audio is popping a little bit. Uh, let me turn down the level a little bit, and then we'll just get this started. So, first part, physics and general concepts. So I'm going to be running you guys through basically um, what things do we need to consider physically when we're actually doing this design. So basically how this relates to picking motors and actually what considerations we take when we do the design. So, let's start with uh, like an analysis of what our goal is. So, our, obviously our goal for this project is to build a robotic goalie. Um, focusing right now on the glove hand, we're not focusing on the stick hand. Uh, so, for those of you that are unaware, hockey goalie has two main things. Oh, my camera, you can't see everything. They have a, well, if you're left-handed, a right-handed goalie you put the stick in your right hand you hold it like like this and you put the glove in your left hand you hold it like this and you like stand there in the net like this your stick moves this way your glove moves this way right now we're focusing on the glove hand um why no reason in particular but i want to focus on one thing at a time so we're going to focus mo mainly on the glove hand um so some general notes like, how big is the goalie? Uh, typically, most NHL goalies or even amateur goalies um, with full equipment on, with your skates on, you stand about six feet tall. 
probably a little bit less. Uh, for the purpose of this, I believe we're going to use six feet just because it's a pretty standard number. Uh, how long does the arm need to be? So we're going to estimate the arm to be no longer than one meter. Uh, so that's one meter from the shoulder to the end, like to where the glove is. How heavy will it be? So we need to consider a few things here. Obviously, need to, we need to consider the weight of the material. Um, beyond that, we also need to consider how heavy is the equipment that the goalie wears uh, that we're going to be moving around. The reason we need to be considering this is because we want the goalie to actually wear goalie equipment. Um, we're doing this project in collaboration with TSN, and TSN has been kind enough to gift us a whole goalie, um, a whole goalie set of equipment. So we want to put the goalie in the equipment so that it looks like the real deal, because it's just cool. Uh, so the goalie equipment as a whole, so their whole upper body's worth of equipment is about 20 kilograms. So I estimated that one arm probably weighs about five kilograms. Um, so how much weight does it need to move and how heavy will it be? Those are kind of the same question. Um, in total, it's going to be about 10, 15 kilograms. We're going to say 10. And then what is the range of motion? So we're going to say the range of motion is about 180 degrees. And we're going to get into that here in a second. I'm going to do a quick little drawing uh, just after. Actually, no, I'll do the drawing right now. So give me a quick second. Okay, wonderful. So now here I am in the Linux equivalent of paint. And I'm gonna draw you guys the goalie really quick. So this is just generally what we expect um, the goalie to look like in terms of uh, the frame and like the shoulders and the width and everything. So, okay. So this is the body in green here. I'm gonna pick blue, not pink, blue. This is going to be the arm, so this is the shoulder joint. This would be like the bicep. This would be like the forearm. And then the glove lives down here. Obviously, the glove doesn't look like this. This is just like a poor rendition. Um, there's a few lengths here that are very important to us. So we asked earlier, how long is the arm? That would be this length here. We're going to call this L. And we're going to say that L is no more less than or equal to one meter uh we'll call the bicep l1 and the forearm l2 there's obviously some angle in here we'll call this oops uh i don't think there's an eraser here so i'm just gonna have to make it work we'll call that theta um that's kind of hard to tell uh yeah so really in terms of like structurally of the goalie that's really all there is to it uh, there's a few things we need to consider actually with this goalie and these things are here we'll really quickly go back to the slides and then i'll explain this stuff uh start from here so what forces are uh what forces do we need to consider there's really only two forces two main forces we need to consider when we're designing something like this um the force of gravity so how much force is required to like how much force of how what is the force of gravity that's going to be acting on the end of the arm uh pushing it down towards the ground and then the applied force is basically the reverse of that how much force do we need to apply up to keep the arm from falling and beyond that making the arm actually move because the base force to actually keep the arm stationary uh to oppose the force of gravity is not very much and it's not enough force to actually allow us to move the arm with any significant amount of speed. And you'll see that uh, when we get on to calculations. So let's go back to the drawing really quick. Oh, yeah, this is the one I wanted. So let's draw those forces. Uh, the first force is going to be the force of gravity. So we'll call that FG. And the second force is going to be the force applied. Oops. Uh, so, FG, uh, FA is going to be greater than or equal to FG um, so that the arm can actually move. And then in terms of rotation, oh my god, this arm is going to rotate approximately 180 degrees. Now, it can rotate probably more than that, but we don't need it to rotate more than that. 180 degrees is way more than enough. 
Um, because if you think about it, let me draw another really quick picture. Imagine this is our goalie net. And here's our goalie in the net. Wow, beautiful picture. I should became an art student. Um, 180 degrees is plenty of rotation. It's going to cover basically all the way to down here and all the way up here. So even some of this rotation is not necessary. And also, this is nowhere near to scale. The goalie's shoulder will actually be above the top of the net. Uh, now give me a second here to clear away my drawing. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit about the actual forces involved. So, let me let me just redraw this neater and smaller. Okay. So up here. L, L1, L2. This angle doesn't really matter too much. It's really just for like detailed design. So we'll draw it later. Um, FG, FA, and L is less than or equal to one meter. So, I mean black. So let's talk a little bit about the actual forces applied, uh, the forces involved. So first things we need to consider with force um, I'm assuming if you've made it this far, everybody knows that force is mass times acceleration. Uh, so the mass we talked about a little bit, it's going to be approximately 10 kilograms. It's actually probably going to be less. So this is an overestimate. This is actually something we want to do. We want to overestimate um, because when we're specking motors and we're buying parts, if we overestimate the design, um, it makes it more or less foolproof. Uh, what I mean by that is the more weight we spec to move and the less weight that is actually present on the arm, the faster the arm will actually move. It'll be able to accelerate faster. Now, keep in mind that its top speed will probably be slower than if we underestimated, but not by much because the range that we would end up with the gearbox, and you'll see this in a little bit when we get into the actual calculations, um, is not significant between like five kilograms and 10 kilograms. Re realistically, we'd end up with the same gearbox. Um, it's just like minor, minor differences. And also, you'll see, you'll see. Um, okay, so let's calculate the force of gravity. And a lot of people are going to get mad at me here. So I'm going to say 10 kilograms is our, our, um, our mass. And no gravity is 9.81. I'm going to say 10 because it's going to make the math way easier. And also, in the spirit of rounding up, this is just going to give us 100 newtons instead of 98 newtons. Um, no, so that means that our force applied at a very minimum must be greater than or equal to 100 newtons. Um, it's going to be significantly greater. Uh, so, yeah, that is... Ooh, oh, no. There you go. Let's see if I can draw a straight line. Yeah. That's going to be our force of gravity and our force applied. So another thing we need to consider when we're designing something like this is what torques are involved because we actually deal mainly in torque, not so much in force. Uh, so the torque due to gravity is fairly simple. It's really just Fg times L, where L is this length up here. So if we have 100 newtons times one meter, we have 100 newton meters. Nice and easy. So at a very minimum, our gearbox and motor combination needs to output at least 100 newton meters in order to stay like stationary. So in terms of physics, that's really all there is to it actually. There's not too much to a problem like this. Really, we just have a rotating mass. Um, and we're just trying to figure out what is the minimum amount of force required to rotate our mass. So this is really all we need to calculate in order to estimate our design. Now, in reality, 
you could have gone away without actually doing this step. It's nice to have a good baseline to work from. So now I know that my gearbox configuration, at a very minimum, needs to produce 100 newton meters of torque. So anything less than that, I know for a fact, is not going to work at all. It wouldn't even be enough to hold the arm stationary, let alone move it. So I'm going to transition here back to uh, the PowerPoint. Wonderful. Okay, so we talked about the forces. Let's really quickly talk about some considerations. So, overestimate everything. Um, now, don't grossly overestimate. Like, if the thing is 10 kilograms, don't say it's 100 kilograms because then you're going to end up with something that doesn't work. But if it's like, if it's like 7 kilograms, round it up to 10 because it's one, it's going to make the math easier. Two, you're going to buy a slightly heavier duty part and it's going to perform a little nicer over time. Um, I tend to always round up, so you saw me round gravity up. Uh, again, that's mostly just to make the math easier, not so much to um, for overestimation's sake. But again, it helps uh, putting all of these overestimations together uh, in the final design, and you'll see that in a little bit. Uh, assume it to be heavier than anticipated. I talked about this briefly. Again, this goes with this whole thing. If I expect it to be 10 kilograms and it ends up being 5 kilograms, I know for a fact that my arm is going to be able to move smoothly and to whatever position and speed with whatever speed I need it to be. Um, and then this is really in the spirit of safety factors. Um, what I mean by safety factors is we need to consider a certain amount of leeway in our design for safety we call it basically the safety we're talking about is like project safety and budget safety um if we design something too close to the mark basically uh, well if we design it too close to the mark let's say we design it exactly like it, it we design it to be exactly as it needs to be and then it ends up being slightly different in the real world our design is not going to work and now we have to spend more money and spend more time redesigning and reproducing our product uh, so, what torques are involved? Uh, we talked about this. It's the same as the forces. Torque due to gravity, torque applied. And, yeah. So, really quickly, we're going to talk about what options we have in terms of motors we can use, what gearboxes we can use, and what parts we should use. And then we're going to talk about how we calculate which combination of these parts we should be using. So, give me another quick second here to switch... Okay, now, today I'm mostly going to be showing you guys parts from this company. Uh, this is called VEX. Uh, VEX runs competitions. They also uh, provide parts for another competition called the First Robotics Challenge. They provide parts for the First Tech Challenge. They also run their own competitions called the VEX Competition. Um, if you're not new to R3, and you've been here for a long time, you probably would have competed in VEXU. That's the university version of this VEX competition. Um, VEX is a really good website. They make good parts. Uh, they're pretty quality, and they're all pretty integrated. So what I mean by integrated is like one VEX part will for certain work with another VEX part, and anything on their website will work together for the most part. Um, so we're going to be looking mostly at gearboxes, what options do we have for gearboxes, and what options do we have for motors. I'm going to briefly talk about the two different types of motors and the different types of gearboxes that we have, and give examples on the website. And then I'm also going to talk about some motors that are not on this website, and then we're going to get into actually calculating. So let's start with, let's start with the motors, actually. So there's two, oh, uh, actually... I missed one. Neo, rev, okay. Well, that loads. Okay. So this is a sim motor. Uh, this is a pretty common motor in uh, in terms of our team. We've used this motor quite a bit. And in terms of like competition robotics, um, it's a pretty big motor. It's like six, seven inches from the back of the motor to the tip of the shaft. Uh, as you can see written on it, it's a 12 volt DC motor. So this is a brushed DC motor. Uh, what that means is there's little brushes that ride on the commutator and basically they induce an electrical field making it spin. 
Uh, one second. For those of you in the chat saying I have audio issues, thank you. I do have noise suppression on. I think I probably just have the mic up too loud. So it's probably causing other issues. Thanks, Dylan. Um, yeah, so this is a turbo DC motor. You can run this at a higher voltage. Uh, you can run it at a lower voltage. Really, it just needs any kind of voltage to spin. Um, now, the VIX website's very resourceful. It's very useful. It gives you a lot of document, a uh, lot of information on these motors. It gives you documents. It gives you CAD drawings. It gives you um, like specifications for the part. So really quickly, we'll go over the specifications, and I'll show you guys the drawings and the CAD. So um, this is really just the input voltage. Like I told you a second ago, it could be twelve. It could be more than twelve. It could be less than twelve. It'll spin. Um, Output shaft, so really that's this guy. It's just giving you some details on it. Uh, free speed, so this is the unloaded free speed. So this is like nothing. You've got the motor on the bench. You plug it into the battery. How fast is it going to spin? About 5,000 RPM. Free current, this is how much current the motor draws at that speed. Maximum power is basically how much power you draw. Oh, okay. Um, how much power you draw at maximum output. So this motor draws about 400 watts at maximum, well, say 350 watts at maximum output. Stall torque, this is an important number to us, and stall current is also a very important number to us. This is the maximum amount of torque the motor can apply. So very clearly, this motor alone cannot do our job. We need a gearbox to make it produce more torque. Um, stall current, uh, is how much current the motor is going to draw at stall. Stall is when it's working the hardest. At stall, it's not moving, but it's still energizing, so it's really trying to push as hard as it can. So it's going to draw 131 amps. That's like a ton of current. Now, here are some of the, document, the documents and downloads. So they give you like performance specification, part drawing, you can see they give you like the full CAD, uh, the full drawing. They also have a little tab here for drawings. And then down at the end here, there's a tab for CAD. The VEX website's actually really nice. It's got an integrated like preview feature. So if my internet doesn't clap out here and it takes a minute, uh, it'll pull up the preview for the design. Uh, sorry, for the part. And yeah, you can see it here. You can actually even let you measure it. So you can like put it like a measurement tag from here to here. And it'll tell you the lengths of each part and stuff. It's really solid, this tool. Uh, sorry, this website. Now, another brushed DC motor that we have available to us is the 775 Pro. We actually use this one a lot more. We've used this one on our Rover uh, quite a bit. We've used this one in the designs for our arms. Uh, we've used this in other projects. It's a very versatile motor. Um, overall, it's actually a stronger motor than the sim motor. It's much smaller, so this motor in total is probably about 4 inches from, from tail to tip. Uh, it produces similar power, so here, you can go to the information. It actually produces closer to 350 watts. Uh, its free speed is significantly higher than that of the sim. It spins at close to 19,000 RPM. Um, the free current is also, sorry. Is also significantly lower. It's closer to one amp as opposed to two point five amps. And the stall torque, though, however, because of the very high free speed, is significantly lower. Now that being said, with a little bit of gearing to the same to the equivalent speed of the uh, sim motor, the seven seven five produces more torque. Actually, it's a more powerful motor. Um, and that's actually evident in the stall current. It ends up drawing more current and producing more power at stall. Um, so, like I mentioned, these are brushed DC motors. Brushed DC motors can be a little less efficient than their brushless DC counterparts. Um, that's not necessarily due to, like, internal friction or anything. It's more just uh, power delivery. Uh, brushed DC motors have a less linear power delivery whereas brushless dc motors tend to have more continuous power delivery 
So this is a brushless motor. Um, brushless motors are significantly different than their brushed counterparts. So they have usually just two or three parts. Uh, there's like I believe the top part is the uh, this is the rotor and then there's a stator that goes inside with little magnets and basically the magnets on the rotor are like permanent magnets like neodymium magnets and then inside we put electromagnets and basically we pulse like uh, we rotate uh, which magnets which pair of magnets are being pulsed at a given time and that causes the rotor to rotate um, because of this, uh, because of the nature of a brushed DC motor, you can get a lot more linear torque output. So what I mean by that is you get the same or very similar amounts of torque at lower speeds as you do at higher speeds, uh, which is very, very useful. Actually, in a design like this, this is extremely useful because you can move the arm really slow and still get a lot of power output whereas with the brushless brushed dc motor in order to like get the acceleration that you want you have to get it going pretty quick um yeah these come usually with integrated hall effect sensors so you can actually see there's three windings i mentioned this uh there's three colors here there's three primary windings inside and then they're grouped into like sections so like they might do let's say there's uh, let's say there's nine magnets just for the sake of this design. There's nine electromagnets, or sorry, for the sake of this explanation. Uh, there's nine electromagnets. They're paired into, no, let's say six. They're paired into twos, and there's three groups. So basically, there's like one, two, one, or here. I have a better idea. Haha. -ha. Let me pull back my tablet here. So, let's imagine it's like this. Wow, that's surprisingly circular. One, two, three. Let's imagine these properly go around, but for the sake of explanation, this is good enough. So, your the rotor has magnets on it as well. And basically, when you energize this magnet, it's going to push the rotor this way. So the rotor is going to spin. And then you energize this magnet, pushing it further. And then you energize this magnet, pushing it further. And basically, there's like pairs of magnets on the opposing sides. So the more pairs you have, the more uh, efficiently you can push the motor, uh, producing more torque. Typically, they have like two or three, maybe four magnets per group. Uh, they call them poles, and that's what pushes the rotor along. Okay, now back to the VEX website. Or oh, actually, this is the right website. Uh, this also, you can see there's also a fourth wire here. This is an integrated sensor, so they call this a Hall Effect sensor. Um, it's basically like an encoder. And what they use it for is to keep track of the position of the output shaft, or the rotor. Uh, this is to effectively pulse the uh, the rotor. So basically, uh, sorry, to pulse the windings. This is so that they have an accurate estimation of where the position is so they can adjust the phase so that as you go faster, uh, you can more efficiently pulse. And really, that's all the Hall effect of the sensors for. Uh, basically, just to keep tracking for timing. Now, the Rev website also gives you all of the same spec that the VEX website gives you in a less pretty, I guess you could say, uh, fashion. So they actually have slightly different data. Uh, all of the VEX data, by the way, is empirical data. So this is all measured and tested data. There's actually another thing I can show you guys in a minute, but I'll show you after I explain this. Uh, the REV website gives it to you uh, a little bit mixed up. It gives you the empirical and the theoretical data. Uh, so you can see actually empirically, um, the brushless motor produces more torque. It has a higher peak power, has a lower stall current, a lower free current than the sim motor, but a similar free speed. Um, the theoretical values tend to be a little bit higher, as you can see. So theoretical stall torque is almost one newton meter higher. Uh, it's actually a little bit... Oh, my audio is not working well. Oops. Uh, bear with me here, everybody. Okay, 
Uh, give me a second here, guys. Test, test, test. Oh my god. I'm just listening back to myself. That was terrible. I'm scared for my life. Speak a little bit quieter. Okay. So it's probably just peaking. It's hard to be quiet. I'm not a quiet guy. Oh my god. Test, test, test. Yes, I'm decreasing the volume, Mustafa. Thank you, thank you. I'm working on it. It's it's incremental process because I have to speak, do the change, and then wait to hear myself on YouTube. Oh, that's not better. No, I'm using my headphones. Test, 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 test. It sounds farther. Hold on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it accidentally went to the one that was on the microphone. That was my bad. How's that now? I'm not restarting. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, guys. Did you do something? Yeah, I changed it to the headphones. Oh, that's tragedy. Tragedy has struck as it naturally would. Okay, I gotta stop listening to myself. Ah, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the help, everybody. Um, okay, let's get back to it. Uh, I guess we'll cut that out of the actual thing we turn into a YouTube video for the VOD action. Okay. Um, so, yeah, basically, the brush... Uh, the BLDC, they give you all the documents as well. It's just not as pretty. And you don't have, like, um, like the previewer that uh, Vex has. Now, really quick, I wanted to show you guys something. Vex actually has a really good resource on their, on their website. They've gone ahead and empirically tested all these motors and then mapped out all the data into, like, graphs so that you can, like easily pick out which motor you want for what and compare the motors <gasps> did they get rid of it oh well they used to have it now they don't have it that's oh this is a tragedy so many tragedies in one day this is ridiculous okay let's talk about gearboxes so uh let's talk about this gearbox first so first um like I mentioned, Vex has a whole line of products that work seamlessly together. Um, so this is mostly gearboxes and motor combinations. They call this their Versa Planetary Gearbox. Uh, Versa for like Versatile, they name all their stuff this. If you like go through their things, it's like Versa Hubs, Versa Stock, Versa whatever. Because they aim to be versatile. Um, we are mainly going to use this Versa Planetary Gearbox for two reasons uh planetary gearbox is going to give us the gear ratio that we want in a small form factor like significantly smaller than a normal gearbox also 
um they're really durable and it's really easy to get the gearing configuration we want in this gearbox also you'll see in a minute that anything else to get an equivalent gearing ratio is going to be huge and really not designed for the purpose that we're using it for where this is designed for the purpose that we're using it for as you can see they have a lot of options actually they have like this is their primary version made out of aluminum they have like a plastic version if you have a lightweight design they got like this 90 degree turn thing if you want it if your power is coming in this way and you want to transmit it out this way so if you're tight for space or if you need to do 180 degrees um they have this dual motor input this guy's going to come back up you will see this guy again in a few minutes they have like a ratcheting system so like let's say you're building like a lift mechanism and you don't want it to be able to fall back down they have this ratchet so you can actually have it like stop itself with a brake basically they have an integrated encoder so you can accurately check how far your your arm has swung or whatever you've put this design into they have documentation for everything um it's insane so let's talk about this one uh this is very similar to the configuration we're going to use in it actually it's closer to uh, it's none of these we're actually going to end up using two stages in a little bit you'll see um these gearboxes are pretty foolproof basically the motor slops on the end they have a start like a first stage that's basically just an aluminum block to house everything the, in the the next stage is the first actual gearing stage and then they have an output stage the output stage houses a bearing and some retention clamps um yeah they're fairly robust so you can see they give you all the documentation for everything like how it all mounts how to put it together it's all really really good stuff they also give you the cad files now the way a planetary gearbox works i don't think i'm gonna have a good image here to show you oh yes or actually, just give me a moment. <gasps> wow. 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 I'm so bad at this. I just spent five minutes explaining stuff. Not even realized I was... Wow. Okay, let me go back. So, this is the Vex website. This is the Versa Planetary stuff uh versa is for versatile um this is the main gearbox that we're going to use it's an aluminum construction uh it's very very good it's very rigid it's very easy to use uh they have other renditions of this gearbox they have a plastic version uh they have a 90 degree output version they have a 180 degree output version if you're really tight for space it's actually 180 degree input technically the gearbox is the same and then you input this way um they have this dual motor input thing where you can do like two 775s or two, they call them bag motors, they're small, uh, into a single seven seven uh, into a single Versa planetary gearbox. They have a ratcheting mechanism. You heard me explain the ratcheting mechanism about a minute ago. And then they have this encoder. Oh my god. <laughs> um, this is the Versa planetary gearbox, so this is the one that we're going to end up using in our design. Um, we're actually going to end up using the two stage version this is a single stage you can see there's only one guy in the middle here the one we're going to use is actually going to have four parts so the back where the motor mounts two internal stages and then the output stage um yeah there's really not that much to it now give me a second to find a picture of a planetary gearbox Okay. Ooh, this is the one I want. Beautiful. Okay. So, this is how a planetary gearbox works. Um, this is exactly how the Vex gearbox works. Basically, there's a... Uh, they call it in the internal gear basically it's the actually the external gear it's like on the outside uh they have these little planets that rotate around the sun or they orbit around the sun um and they transmit power from the carrier to sorry from the input stage to the carrier so they ride on the carrier the input stage would be the sun gear which is being spun by a motor or something uh the planets the planets rotate along the internal gear so they use the 
this spline on the outside and then they spin the carrier and then the carrier would have a little gear on it like the sun gear here and it would spin the next stage so that's how ours is going to work there's actually going to be one stage that spins the carrier the carrier is going to have a little pinion on it and it's going to spin the next stage and then that carrier is going to spin the output shaft um the other types of gearboxes that we have available to us are like normal spur based gearboxes so here let me pull up like this one so this is from a subsidiary company that like does products for vex uh wcp stands for west coast products um don't ask me where the name comes from i have no idea uh these you can see actually in this cad drawing they have uh sim motors on it you could use 775s you could use brushless motors really does it make a difference <laughs> sorry um now the reason we're not using a big chonky gearbox like this this actually got three motors on it you just can't see the third motor. it's down there um these are meant for speed not so much for torque you can't get the torque that we're looking for in a nice form factor with a gearbox like this like you can do something similar but it's gonna be huge and you're gonna require external gearing so like i think the maximum you could probably get out of this is probably like 50 or 60. yeah not even so actually total reduction is like five or six times we need significantly more than that we need a total reduction of at least like 100 uh which is way way too much for a gearbox like this now that being said we could put pulleys or gears on the outside but we're trying to avoid that we don't want to build an extra gearbox on top of this gearbox just to make it work there's options that are better such as this guy these guys use spur gears so you can see these are like normal gears as you would expect they work exactly as you'd expect. They don't do anything special. They're not like planetary gearbox or, or like a worm gear or whatever. It's like a normal gear. So you have one gear here, another gear here, and they spin each other. Um, and there's really not that much to it. These are pretty foolproof again. So really, you just, they have a design template. You put the template into your design. You put those holes into your design, and then it just works. Um... And really, that's all there is to it in terms of gearboxes and stuff. Now, there's a few other options. Like, we could use worm gears and stuff like that. But that's really going to complicate the design. It's kind of unnecessary. It also takes away some features that are... I wouldn't say necessary, but they're niceties. So, for example, being able to backdrive the arm. So, being able to push it is a nicety that we'd like to have. Uh, with a worm gear or something like that, they would offer more gear ratio and a smaller form factor. You can't really back drive. You can't push the arm yourself. Um, you have to, like, turn it on and spin the motors. Which is not always ideal. So, here, let us go to the calculator. So, we're going to use this calculator to help us design our or help us pick our gearbox and motor configuration. This is the JVN calculator. This is a first robotics resource, but it's also useful for our purposes. Um, they have a lot of options here. You can calculate like dual speed gearboxes for like drivetrains, single speed, a bunch of stuff. You can do articulating drives, which is like where uh, I won't get into it. It's complicated uh we're focusing actually on a rotary mechanisms uh, you can see here that i've actually done some stuff with this before so i'm going to clear it out uh, one one uh four i'll leave 22 and i'll put 40. so we're going to start with the sim motor we're going to spec a design for the sim motor then we're going to do it for the 775 so we can see the improvements that the 775 offers and then we're going to do a real specification for a gearbox and motor. So based on what parts we have available to us. So what parts we can purchase from Vex. And yeah. Then we're going to... After that, uh, we'll probably end up wrapping it up. And then I'll see you guys in the next part. So let's get into this. Um, so first, a few things. The arm load is 22 pounds. Um, 
10 kilograms times 2.2 2.2 is the conversion from imperial to metric for mass um so 10 kilograms times 2.2 22 pounds arm length so 40 inches is approximately equal to one meter it's a little bit less it's a little bit more actually than one meter one meter is like one times 25 one thousand or it's divided by 25.4 see it ends up being a little bit less than 40 so we're just going to use 40 because overestimate um now a few things here this calculator is pre-built so really we just have to enter the numbers and all of the equations are built into everything we don't actually need to know the specific equations we just need to know what the equations are doing what they calculate for that being said if you want to investigate what the equations are for um if you've used excel you know that you can just click on the cell and it will show you the equation that you're doing so you can like work it backwards and reverse engineer it if you want uh we'll provide the link for this we'll put it in the description i guess um yeah so a few things here gearbox efficiency um most likely the gearbox is going to be more efficient than 65 percent, but it could be less efficient so really designing for 65 percent is fairly safe um it goes with our spirit of overestimating and keeping safety factors uh and one motor per gearbox so this assumes that we're calculating just for one gearbox so the number of motors per gearbox would be like if we have two motors per gearbox it's two motors fed into one gearbox with the same reduction uh right now i have it just at one to one uh so it's really impossible for it to do the job we need it to do you can see these numbers are like astronomical or like will not appear uh that's because it's impossible to do the job we want it to do now a really easy place for us to start is we know we need 100 newtons and we know this spins at 2.4 newtons so at a very minimum we need about 42 to 1 gear ratio just to get it to hold itself in place so let's stick that in here and see what it pops out for us so 42 to 1 overall gear ratio it's super fast it's not strong enough to actually move itself. That's why these numbers are negative. You can see that st uh, the loaded current draw. So it's important to actually keep your eye on current draw because it's one thing to design something that is possible. And it's one thing to design something that's just like... Uh, so let me rephrase that. It's one thing to design something that works. And it's another thing to design something that's possible. Just because it's possible uh, doesn't mean that it should be that way 130 amps is way too much current now i could increase this to like 50 to 1 and it's just enough or probably just barely enough to actually move the arm but you can see this current is huge like 110 120 amps this is like insane amount of current your car when it turns on in the winter it does not even draw this much current like your engine could be frozen the starter motor would barely struggle to draw that much current this is like huge, huge, huge numbers. Um, like, I can't even. I, I'm trying to think of uh, something similar that would draw. Like, industrial machines wouldn't even draw this much current. This is like astronomical. Um, so, let's pick a gear ratio that's a little bit more appropriate. Let's try and get this current down and let's try and get these numbers into realistic places. So,. Let's see what 100 to 1 looks like. 100 to 1 is actually not a terrible overall ratio. It's speedy, but it's not super speedy. So ideally, we're looking to get this thing moving from in like a full 90 degree rotation. So from, from, from down here to up here in about half a second, ideally less. If it's got to be more, it's got to be more. There's not much we can do. Like if there's no way to get it less, then we got to live with it but we're aiming for less than half a second right now we're actually already over half a second but i want to get this current into a reasonable place 60 amps 55 amps is still pretty high for current especially for like continuous current draw so if it's pulling this current the whole time it's moving it's going to get really hot the whole system is going to get really hot and it's going to be working really hard also you can see it only takes a few more pounds for it to actually stall out so let's say our design ends up being heavier than we expect it to be like by five ten pounds we're going to stall the arm 
and then we're screwed, which is no good. Uh, so let's double this ratio. So I'm just going to put a 2 down here. That's going to double the overall ratio. You can see it brings our current down to about 30 amps. It's a little more sustainable. Our stall load is 70, uh, 70 pounds. And you can see actually... Oh, I broke it. Oh, there we go. You can see we're actually approaching one second in terms of 90 degree rotation. Now that's pretty slow. One second for something that's only got to go this far and only move 10 kilograms is slow. Especially since we want it to respond. Like if you think about the chain of action that needs to happen, uh, whether this thing is autonomous or teleoperated, teleoperating being we control it. Um, if we're teleoperating it and... So let's imagine that the somebody's skating towards the net. We see that. We tell the goalie to move the arm. Our controller has to transmit that action. Uh, the goalie has to receive that action, perceive that action, do the action. Then it's going to move. It's going to take a second. By the time that happens, they've already shot. The puck's already in the nut, net, and we've already lost the goal. So that's not hot to do 0.82 seconds. Uh, we want to go significantly faster than that. So, really quick, something easily we can do is we can increase the number of motors in our gearbox. Motors are fairly cheap. Sim motor only costs thirty dollars. Let's put a second one in the gearbox. So, two motors. You can see it reduces our current drastically by half. About so, yeah, about half. Um, or actually, exactly half. I think. Uh, you can see. So now our current is about sixteen amps. Um, not exactly half. That was wrong. Uh, you can still see that it's spinning faster, uh, spinning slower than half a second, but it's closer. We've gotten down to 0.7 of a second approximately. Our stall load is now significantly higher, so it's way, way higher. Like, we don't got to worry about the stall load anymore. Uh, what we're concerned with now is how fast we can get it to where it needs to be. So let's play around with the gear ratios a little bit. So 100 to 1. Uh, you can see actually 101 at 30 amps, it's getting there in under half a second. So that's pretty good. This is a viable design. Um, note that this is going to get hot because 30 amps is still quite a bit of current. Typically, we we put breakers on things, so like fuses, so that they don't draw more than 40 amps continuous. Anything more than that, it will just pop off and then it's like not going to work. Uh, let's see if we can increase this gear ratio just a little bit. Yeah. So this is actually completely feasible. Just over half a second, 20 amp stall. This is ideal. Um, now, I want to switch over to the 775 motor because, as I mentioned before, slightly more powerful motor. So that means we should be able to slap on a little bit more gearing so that its speed is the same, but actually get more acceleration out of the gearbox and the motor. So let me just reset everything and change this to the 775. So, uh, I've switched it to the 775. Now, just as a baseline, we need 100 newtons. And this puts out 0.71. So, at a very minimum, we need 141. So, again, you can see 141 to 1 ratio. It can't do it. It's struggling. It's negative here because it cannot do it. It is impossible. If we do 200, even still it can't do it. It's not... Oops. It's not, like, drawing full stall current, but it still cannot actually fully move the arm. It's doing less than the arm load. So let's keep going up. Let's go 250. Now it's doing a little more than the arm load. Oh. As you can see, it's taking forever. This is going so slow, um, which is not good. Now, we're going to do the same trick we did before. We're going to increase the number of motors we have. You can see we increase the number of motors we have, and everything just dropped significantly. So, two motors drops down to 0.35 degrees, per, uh, 0.35 per 90 degree movement. This is like nothing. So actually, it's going to be really easy for us to get the gear ratio that we want here. Like get an ideal gear ratio. So let's try 400. 400 to one ratio, 24 amps. That's pretty good. Uh, we're under half a second still. Stall load is. 80 80 pounds 82 pounds this is pretty good like we're in the right range uh let's go up a little bit more mm, let's see what 500 gives us 500 gives us just over half a second 
this is primo uh we're drawing 20 amps 120 pound stall current uh stall load uh we're doing a 90 degree motion in half a second this is pretty good we could go faster if we wanted to but i think this is good enough for the purposes of our design if we do 450 this would even be good too because it's a little bit faster now one thing we need to consider 450 may be a weird gear ratio to get or 500 may be a weird gear ratio to get we may not be able to get these ideal gear ratios so one thing we want to do when we're designing actually is we want to reference our our like uh our gearbox manufacturer to see which gearboxes we can get so um these do offer quite a range of gearboxes we probably want one of the 100 to 1 or 90 to 1 these are dual stage gearboxes so this is going to take two stages and since we want two 775 motors we're going to need one of these dual motor inputs uh now these have a gear ratio built into them we have a minimum gear ratio so we can do one to one um but it makes sense for us to spread out the load so to put some load into these gears and put some load into the seven seven uh, into sorry into the versa planetary gearbox rather than have all of the gearing in the versa planetary so we can either do this 3.75 or we can do this uh 5.33 we'll have to see which one fits uh which one fits nicely so 100 to 1, uh, this is the Versus Planetary Gearbox. And if I do 3.75, this is like the smaller of the two. Yeah, 3.75 is the smaller of the two gear ratios. Uh, you can see we're drawing about 26 amps. This is not terrible. And we're going pretty fast, 0.42. That's, that's pretty quick. Uh, let's see what the 5.33 gives us. So now our overall ratio is 533. This is quite a bit. You can see we're less than 20 amps, actually, and we're a little bit more than half a second. This is not terrible. Um, this is actually really sustainable. Um, but what we could do is we could do this. Or, sorry, 5.33. And 90. So, this is going to give us, like, an almost ideal... Uh, ideal, like, uh, acceleration and speed. It's going to give us pretty close to ideal current draw for what we were hoping for. The stall load is very nice. 98 pounds. This is pretty good. Um, I'm, I'm happy with this. So with this configuration, what we're going to end up with is one of these guys with the 5.33 overall ratio. And the Versa Planetary with the 90 to 1. So with this 90 to 1 gear ratio. Uh, so this ends up being two stages. We have a nine, sta a nine to one stage and a ten to one stage. Uh, so we end up having two stages in our gearbox, and really, that's all there is to it. Um, yeah, there's not too much more to this whole process. Really, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you take really what you need to do is you start with your baseline. You find out what the minimum amount of torque you need to produce is. Then you walk over to the calculator. Uh, you use that baseline to basically figure out, like, like uh, you do it like a, um, a sanity check, basically. Like, is this even viable? It, like, because you could totally punch some numbers in here, get the velocities that you want, like the accelerations that you want, but and not pay attention to the stall torque and the current, and your gearbox is like never gonna work. Um, so it's good to do that physics as a very baseline uh yeah yeah there's not too much to it um and really that wraps up uh let me double check this presentation oh ah uh, 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 uh. before i run away i got one thing so where can we find these parts i already showed you vex pro there's other resources i showed you rev also that's where the neo motor came from we have other resources available to us to buy parts from. So Andymark is another good manufacturer. Andymark tends to make things that are a little bit more durable because they're not just used for competition robotics. Um, we use Andymark parts on our rover because they produce steel gearboxes and we want the, uh, the rigidity and the strength that is offered by a steel gearbox. Uh, Robot Shop tends to make weaker parts, but they're more for hobby applications. So smaller, lighter duty applications. Uh, typically plastic parts and plastic and brass parts. McMaster car. Now, 
I put McMaster Car here at the bottom of the list because we want to avoid using McMaster Car like the plague, kind of. But it is a very good resource to have in our back pocket. If Vex, Andy Mark, whoever we're going to does not have the part that we're looking for, I would bet you money that McMaster Car has the part, but they're going to charge you an arm and a leg for the part. So avoid using McMaster Car when you can, other than for like commodity items. So like bolts, nuts, washers, uh, stuff like that. McMaster Car is your best friend. Um, actually, yeah, buy that stuff on McMaster Car instead of Vex or Anymark because on Anymark they're gonna upcharge you for that stuff because they gotta buy it from McMaster Car and then sell it to you. But stuff like gears and stuff like that, because they end up getting manufactured, they're gonna cost a little bit more on McMaster Car. Um, and yeah, really, that's all there is to it. So, in part two, we're gonna talk about concept sketching. So where do we place our gearboxes? Where do we place uh, the shoulders, the bearings, the bolt holes, belts, belt lengths, all that good stuff? Um, yeah. Uh, really, that's all there is to it. Um, now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for sticking around, everybody. Uh, if you made it this far, thank you for watching. Thank you for those of you that helped me in chat. Uh, get the scenes and the volume right. Um, I appreciate all the help, everybody. And I hope to see you guys all next time on Friday. Have a good one, guys.